there's a distrust of the teachers, um, uh, and that is just boiling down to a lot of negativity, and uh, it's it's just become a very um, volatile job um, in all areas of teachers and in in administration, um, school boards, and it didn't used to be that way. We used to all be together. We used to all be supportive of each other. We used to all understood each other. Um, and then, you know, when COVID came in, we were getting a lot of support because the teacher, the, you know, parents understood how crazy our day was and how difficult that was. But then we just, again, you know, go right back to the craziness. And, and you can see on now there's a major shortage of educators. And I think we are going to be that is going to be a major, major issue in the next couple of years. No time, no tools, big expectations. How do you transform school culture without derailing the train? Answer, little wins that bring big changes. The flywheel effect, harnessing the power of momentum to create a school culture that celebrates change and drives itself. Hello and welcome. My name is Jordan Pruitt and I'm your host here on the flywheel effect. I'm a former educator now working with the live school teams to support your school's culture vision. Our show focus, focuses on all the opportunities for little wins that can create big changes in school culture. The Flywheel Effect is all about sharing stories of admins, school support staff, and other educational change agents that have succeeded in their initial lifts and have created cultures that have so much momentum, they grow and improve exponentially. Uh, we're joined today by Lisa Keir and Mr. Gary Brooks. Uh, Lisa is an elementary school principal from Lexington, Kentucky. Gary is a former principal who is now a national renowned public speaker and author of the book, Go See the Principal, uh, True Tales from the School Trenches. Um, these folks uh, know each other really well. They both used to work in the same school. Gary used to be the uh, principal of that school. Lisa is now. And I know them through uh, my daughter who is who attends that school. So I'm pretty happy we, we got to be able to get them both on. We can talk a little bit about school culture. But um, Lisa, we'll start with you real quick. Uh, Thank you for coming on. This is back to school week for you. So I, I know you're pulling a lot of long hours right now, but go ahead and introduce yourself. Tell us about what you got going on. Hi, I'm Lisa Keir, as you know me very well, Jordan, and I'm the principal at Liberty Elementary School here in Lexington, Kentucky. And um, Liberty is the largest elementary school in Fayette County. We are a traditional school with a dual language immersion strand that runs through it. So we have a lot going on, lots of people, lots of staff. Uh, so I've been here since we opened, and this is our 13th year, I think, 13th or 14th year. Um, so I've been here since we opened, but this is just my third year as principal. So I'm happy to be here and happy to be here with my former uh, partner in crime, Gary Brooks. Thank you, Lisa. And I know Lisa because I was in a, um, a year-long principal um, mentorship training program called Missile, which some, some of our, our listeners may be you know, uh, Missile members themselves. Uh, Gary, thank you very much for coming on. Uh, a lot of you, a lot of my listeners probably follow you on social media, so they know how busy you are. Um, he just got off a plane uh, literally minutes ago, I think, right? Uh, yep, but if you could tell us where you are, how, how summer's going, and this is crazy time for you, right? Uh, yeah, right now I'm in uh, Arkadelphia, I think, Arkadelphia. I drove from Little Rock about 45 minutes from from Little Rock, going to Bismarck tomorrow to talk about their opening day. So i um, been an educator for 27 years. Uh, Lisa and I have been an administrative team for seven years, I think, is, is how long we were there. Um, uh, and uh, now I'm uh, a substitute for the district. I'm an uh, administrative sub. So when they have somebody that has COVID or pregnancy, they call and say, do you want a sub? And I say, let me think real carefully about that school. And I say, yay or nay. Uh, and then I uh, basically um, travel all over the United States and speak at opening days and conferences and, and PD sessions. Well, thank you very much, sir, for coming on. One of the, um, the thing that comes up in these conversations a lot, because we've had folks from really every corner of the country on the show so far, um, the continuity of leadership and those kind of things are kind of hallmarks of good school culture. Like that's going to come up a little bit in the conversation. And I thought this would be neat because we have, we have one school. We've had two really strong leaders for a long time. And then that, that kind of speaks to the strength of the school. But thank you all for coming on. Um, our first segment is called uh, Be a Change Maker. And the reason it's called that is a lot of our listeners, they're not just listening to scale up the culture in their building or district uh, or even their classroom. Uh, but they want to know how they can be the one that, that makes that change happen. So this is, a little, this is a chance to talk about your careers a little bit, where you started. Um, I like, I like hearing those stories because everybody starts in a little different spot. And when you talk to somebody who's been a principal for a long time and they've been you know, district leaders and stuff, I think it's really interesting when you hear like, oh, I, I started as a, as a sub here. And I was like, 
I was coaching middle school baseball, those kind of things. I think that stuff's really interesting. Um, but uh, Lisa, we'll start with you. How did your career in education begin and how did that experience shape your leadership style now? Well, I did not know what I wanted to be when I grew up until I was 40. So at 40, I went back to school, got my degree in special ed. I knew I wanted to be a special ed teacher. I have uh, two other sisters that are special ed teachers, and I knew I just had a heart for that. So I went back to school, got my degree in special ed, taught for five years as a special ed teacher as I was doing that. I was working on my master's in leadership because my husband said I'm really bossy and I need to be the boss. So, you know, look at Gary. He can tell you. Um, so I... Um, did that and then was like a they called them different names here in Fayette County off and on different things and so um I was that for several years and well until just three years ago but I do kind of like being in the know and seeing what's going on around the school and just kind of knowing a little bit of everything that's going on because I guess I am nosy not not only bossy but I'm nosy and so um it's been a really good fit for me and then when um when Gary came along as my principal, it was life-changing. <laughs> uh, some good ways and some bad ways. No, it was it was really all good. I learned more in those seven years with him that I had learned in all the years before. Um, this is my, I'm starting my 20th year in education. This is, this will be my 20th year. So the years, you know, the three years here, and then with Gary before that, and it just has been a you know, it's a growing, it's a growing situation. I mean, you grow and, and you learn from year to year, you learn what not to do, you learn what to do, you learn how to make things better. But I think coming in as an older, non-traditional student made a big difference for me because I was already, you know, I already had children, already had a family, didn't go through all those things like teachers do a lot. You know, they start when they're 23. So I think coming in as an older person, helped me a lot I, I can speak to the, the young family part that can be tough on on educators um mm -hmm. uh, gary how about you how'd you start uh well i came in from florida i was a um a teacher for four years in florida I taught third and fourth grade and then went into the ministry uh decided that it was more important to be in ministry than it was to be in education and so i did nine years in ministry and then realized that that uh education is a ministry and uh, it's a bigger ministry than actually being in the ministry. Um, and so decided to go back in um, uh, and uh, taught for, uh, gosh, 17 years total in Fayette County, 18 years, maybe 19. Uh, started as a first grade teacher and then went um, as a math interventionist, uh, then was the assistant um, at J.R. Ewan um, uh, with Lisa, and then moved into Bourbon County, um, where I was principal for seven years. Um, and then came back into Fayette County um, at Liberty. So just kind of been right there in Fayette County administration-wise, Bourbon County and Fayette County, um, uh, and uh, years of experience, I think seven or eight years in teaching in different grade levels and different uh, different classrooms. Um, so Lisa and I, I mean, and that segue is excellent. Um, on, on Lisa saying that she's special ed, it's, it brings up a good point to always to hire to your weaknesses because I'm not, I'm not gifted at special ed. And so it was... I, you know, one of the reasons why I feel like Lisa and I were a great fit is because she's gifted at special ed. Um, and that is a very difficult area to lead in uh, as an administrator. The majority of administrators do not come in with special ed experience. And there are a lot of controversies uh, between teachers with special ed, a lot of problems um, of general uh, ed teachers not realizing certain things to do. And so it was really a perfect match, not only with our friendship, um, but also, you know, the experience of uh, her giftedness matches my weaknesses. Um, and it was just, you know, it was a, a great combination all the way around. That's uh, I like I like how you said that uh, you hired your weaknesses because I, I spoke to another principal who um, he was talking about like in the high school level, you end up with like a big team of administrators at a bigger school. Mm -hmm. But he talked about like you're, you're filling out a basketball team. Everybody's got to have a skill set that's different than the others because everybody's got a position. You know, like if everybody had overlapping skills and you're missing something somewhere. Yeah. Um, and so, I do think it helped too. I mean, yes. I, and that is one of the things Gary taught me is that, you know, not a leader can't be strong in all areas and you have to find people to fill that in. But I also think, and we'll probably get to this later, but I also think another part that made Gary and I such a strong team was that we were friends 
before he came here. Like our sons played football together. We, he was, when he was in the ministry, he was one of my children's youth minister. So we've known each other. We had a history. So that, and that doesn't always happen with people. And so I know, you know, you can't say, oh, make sure you're friends with him because sometimes that doesn't work. But for us, it, it really, it was good. We could hit the ground running. We already knew each other well. We were comfortable with each other. We had a trust level. So that helped. So I'm going to go ahead and lead, lead us into the second one. So based on your work and experiences and, you know, uh, both of you had experience outside of education extensively too. Um, could you tell us a little bit about when you go different places, how, to, how can you tell the difference in school culture? Like, what are the what are the signs? Like when you if you you're visiting somewhere and you walk in and go, this place has got a good school culture, or you walk in, well, maybe not. Like what's what stands out? Um, and we'll start we'll start with Gary. You can you can, you can feel climate culture when you when you walk in. That was you know it was it, it naturally happens when someone is in a place they like to be at. They have conversations. Um, they're talking with each other back and forth. You can see that when you walk in a place. Um, the excitement of a group. You know, I'm speaking at uh, district opening days all over the place um, and the excitement of uh, the group and the people that are there um, to be able to be there, the way that you're treated when you walk in as an unknown person um, uh, or, you know, just as somebody there and the way they're handling kids. I mean, you can just see it. Climbing culture, anybody in education can walk in any building or any classroom and they can tell what kind of building it is um, because of the way that they're being respected, the way that others are being respected, the way people are treating each other. Um, and it, it, it's just a feeling and, and you, you feel that you can feel tension and you can feel excitement and you can feel people getting along. Um, and it's, that was one of the big things when I started Liberty of people coming in saying, wow, you know, you guys are such a good team. You know, you can tell the difference in this building, um, uh, right away. And, and they can, the substitutes, especially coming in going, wow, what a difference, you know, um, and you can feel it just by the way you're treating each other and the way people are talking with each other and you can see it in the faces. Um, and it's kind of an obvious thing uh, in any building that you go in. Yeah, he's so, right. Um, and it's hard to say because it's hard to put your finger on it. Um, but it's like, because culture and climate, it's everywhere. I mean, it's everywhere. It's in your routines. It's in your traditions. It's in your expectations. It's in your interactions. I mean, it's, I had a district worker tell me just yesterday on Saturday, I was here, here working and a district person was here doing our, doing some tech technology stuff. And he said, I always love coming to this building. He said, there's about five or six buildings in this County that I love to go in. And he said, there's some that will like fight to go in. Like, no, I want to go there. No, I want to go there. And he said, this is one of those schools. And I said, but what is it? What is it about it? This school that makes you want to come. And he said, it's just something you feel when you come in and the way you're talked to, the way you hear other people talking to themselves, the kids, the kids are happy. So it's just, it's everywhere. Culture's everywhere. Yeah. I, I write a lot about, end up writing a lot about school culture on like our blog. And I'll, I like always saying that, is it somewhere they get to go and like somewhere they, they, or the somewhere they got to be, you know, it's a get to versus got to kind of situation. Um, and uh, to, speaking a little bit to what, what Gary was saying about how you can kind of feel it when you walk in, you talk to people, um, kind of an odd reference, but uh, there's a documentary on Netflix about Woodstock 99 and um, the artist Jewel was on there. And she said like, she got to the, got the stage and it's like, she could kind of sense it in the crowd. They had, there was a little tension there that wasn't right. <laughs> and it's kind of the same thing. Like she, she'd seen a lot of crowds and knew, knew the differences. So, no, uh, I'll have to watch that. I saw good. that advertised. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen it. I want to watch it. Well, and I can um, tell a difference when I go speak somewhere. The audience is there. Um, you know, the climate and culture makes it a good session or, you know, it's, it's a struggle because of the fact that they're not there. And, you know, I always love walking away from anywhere because of what I'm able to present. But it, it, it says a whole lot when you've got great climate and culture. People want to be there. The audience is in there. And you, it's, it's just a feel. It's a feel of the school, a feel of the administration, feel of the front office. The teachers, the bus drivers, is kind of everybody. Yeah, and and both of you mentioned I like how you how you, you brought in folks. There's a lot of times we talk about uh, administrators and teachers, um, but there's a whole lot of folks that takes to, to run schools, and some of them see a lot of different schools, like, like you were saying, like they may go to a lot of places. Um, one thing I found when I was uh, I, I was a dean was I would talk to the bus drivers a lot because I ran the bus loop, and they they would kind of tell you like what it was like being in the different bus loops. And there was a difference there too, uh, which was interesting. Um, yes. Last one in this section, 
Um, and this is kind of a big, broad question. If, um, if you, because there's a lot of a lot of really smart people in education, a lot of folks who are really talented and they do a lot of good work. Um, if if you could talk to those folks and point them in a direction, and say, all right, work on this, fix this, lift this rock. Uh, where where's the where would you where would you start, man? We'll start with Lisa on this one. Uh, gosh, I mean, it's it's so I don't the a rock to lift. I I mean. I don't want to say, you know, probably the big thing that people would say is funding, but I don't feel that way. I mean, I feel like I don't, I mean, I have what we need. We have what we need. I mean, do we have the best of everything? No, but we have what we need. Um, so wouldn't you, I wouldn't even say funding. And I hate to say, and I don't want to say, you know, safety is a big thing, but it's not a, you know, that's just one of the things that's on people's minds a lot right now. But then I think, okay, technology, like we're never catching up with technology. Like schools are never tech caught up with technology. It's like, it's so ever changing and progressing It's a school cannot keep up. And so that's been really hard on us right now. Like we have old smart boards and they're obsolete. The the software is obsolete. And so we need to be upgrading to all these interactive flat panels. Well, they're really expensive, but by the time I fill my whole building with finally IFPs, it'll be moved on to something else. That's better, you know, bigger, better, greater. Um, You know, and then I think social media has played such a big part in schools now. And Sometimes it causes problems in elementary school. I mean, there's not really one rock. I don't, that's a hard question. I don't know. Gary, you, you take it because I don't know. Well, I, you know, I think right now the biggest struggle that, that we're having is, is just the political divide that we're having in the nation. And what I'm seeing in schools is because we have um, we are so divided um, in so many different areas. And now it's coming onto school boards. And we are very lucky in Fayette County that we don't have that. Um, but let me tell you what, it's all over the world. I mean, I have been probably the past out of the past 10 districts, them are having major issues, uh, major confrontations, um, uh, uh, just a lot of things that I, I feel like there's a distrust of the teachers. Um, uh, and that is just boiling down to a lot of negativity and, uh, it's, it's just become a very, um, volatile job, um, in all areas of teachers and in, in administration, um, school boards, and it didn't used to be that way. We used to all be together. We used to all be supportive of each other. We should all understood each other. Um, and then, you know, when COVID came in, we were getting a lot of support because the teacher, the, you know, parents understood how crazy our day was and how difficult that was. But then we just, again, you know, go right back to the craziness. And, and you can see on now, there's a major shortage of educators. And I think we are going to be that is going to be a major, major issue in the next couple of years that we're, you know, one state just allowed college students to become teachers that they can teach as a college student. Uh, you know, another uh, is, is allowing the military people to come in with no experience and not that they might not be amazing teachers, um, but we are just getting into some uh, places that we've never been in. And I think it has to be uh, it has to do with the discord of not being respected, not being supported, uh, constantly being put on. Uh, on the, the, you know, the ironing board of, of what is it, this, what is that being pulled in two different ways rather than being allowed to teach. And we've had so many political issues pulled into the schools that don't need to be in there that are not in there, but they're acting like it is. Um, we're just having a lot of struggles all the way around. And so it's going to, it's, it, we're going to, it's going to be difficult for the next five and six years because we are losing teachers. We are not replacing teachers. And, um, I just think that the respect level, um, they, we are very respected and, and very loved, and the parents support that. Um, we're still just struggling in that area just because of the divide that we have kind of overall. Yeah, that the shift in, in support during that time period you're talking about, it was it was dramatic. Like you could, you could almost see like it was almost like it's like a little bit too much early, and then then it just really caved in really quickly, and educators kind of felt in the in the middle of it a lot, uh, which is having to do with a lot of the shortages Absolutely. pretty much everywhere right now. All right, guys, we'll jump into our last segment here. It's called uh, Let's Move the Flywheel. So our show's called The Flywheel Effect because of the whole idea of those little wins that create inertia and then they, they keep on going through momentum 
And once you have a little win, you've created kind of a like that culture avalanche that just can't can't be stopped, and it just keeps going. Uh, which is one of the reasons I want to have you both on here because you guys have a good culture at your school, and it was started with with one administration, and carried on to the next. I think that's that's a really cool thing. And as much turnover as there is in schools, I think it's really, it's important that we think about that. Um, how do you keep it going from one person to the next? Um, but I'm going to start with uh, with Gary on this one. Can you share a story of a of a small change you led or observed, or it could have been could have been a story you were told? That's that's fine too. Uh, that deliberately changed deliberately changed the culture of a school, but it was a small doable thing because we're looking for so like if our listeners are we're looking for little wins. Well, I think with Liberty coming in, and I think probably my whole philosophy in administration is. Um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm too old to do things that I, I don't think I should do. Um, and so when there was a directive that was burdening, um, I, you know, I came in saying that we need to be the change agent and we need to discuss with central office that we're not going to do it this way. We're not going to do this. And this is the reason why, um, we always follow protocol, um, office. And if they want us to do something, we will do it. But we also don't just, um, blindly go in and, um, you know, decide that we're going to, we also don't just blindly go in and, and decide, um, you know, this is what they're saying. So this is what we're going to do. Um, Liberty built great relationships. And so Lisa and I could both get on the phone call with Lori Bowen, who's, you know, in curriculum or, you know, Sharonda, who's assistant superintendent and say, look, you all are asking us to have the teachers turn in lesson plans every Friday this is why we don't think we should do this. And this is what we think we should do. Or, you know, we're asking for this, uh, to, you know, to come down to that. We're doing these learning checks. This is why this is going to be a struggle. And this is why this is not working for us. You know, you're asking us to adopt this curriculum and this curriculum doesn't fit us in ways. Um, Liberty has a lot of respect because we're Spanish immersion. And so there's a lot of things that don't just automatically fit when you've got a dual language program um, where you can just say, boom, here's the curriculum. Um, the high quality curriculum not be high quality in the Spanish um, section. So we really worked to develop positive relationships with central office, to be respectful of the people that are down there, to always listen to them, but also be a change agent and to be willing to go out there and boldly say, uh, you know, we're willing to do this, but we're going to do it just about this much because you're requiring it because all it's doing right now is making busy work for us. And we were willing to be able to do this. And I think it really just changed atmospheres on saying, um, you know, we're going to fight for what's best for our teachers. We're going to fight for what's best for our, our school. But mostly we're going to fight for what's best for the students. Um, and we, because of the positive relationships we built with central office, we always had support. And a lot of times they came back and say, no, this is what you're going to do. But they always listened. And we were bold and saying, this is why we think this should be different. Um, and so, you know, we stepped in saying we want to be change agents. Um, and we want to support the teachers because in order to support the kids, we got to support the teachers. And I feel like that was done through positive relationships with Fayette County um, and just the respect that we had for them and they had for us. And we were able to, you know, make some changes and do some things and say and get some leeway and then also have some of them say, nope, you're going to do this. But we were at least able to be heard and, and were able to make some changes. So I like that a lot because we um, we interviewed a um, she's a, a PBS professional from California and um, we did a webinar with her about a month ago and her name's uh, Kim Wood. And she was talking about uh, they have a really large district and she mentioned, you know, having standards and she was talking about PBS, but this could be for any program or any initiative, um, you know, having standards like across the board, but understanding the folks on site have got to make it fit their school because you even if you're at a large district, like your district is not going to have the same culture from one corner to the next because these are community schools and they have different Absolutely. kids, they have different folks working there. And you've got to adjust whatever you put your, your, your sending down needs to be adjusted at that school level because they know the people there. Um, so I, right. I like that you said that. Like it, it kind of brought something back from a little bit ago. Um, Lisa, what do you got? Well, mine's not as big and deep as Gary's, but like I was thinking of some things that, you know, that, we did here that made small changes that made a big difference. Like for example, Gary kind of introduces like healthy competition between grade levels. Like we would do um, on Halloween, Halloween costume uh, competition. And I mean, it has gotten out of control. Like it started really little, like this team, whoever wins or get lunch, you know, free lunch, you get to go out to lunch and we'll pay for it. And, but I mean, it has gotten 
Like they go above and beyond. And, but it makes like, they're happy doing it. They, they enjoy it. They enjoy the competition, but the kids, they, the kids benefit from it. Um, so just little things like that. Another one that Gary started that I think made a big impact is we would do at Christmas time, a teacher kid party. So if you were a teacher's kid in our building, Gary and I hosted a Christmas party for the teacher's kids, like right before Christmas break. Like we would send them a little note in the mail and invite them. We'd say, your parents are not allowed. We'd like black out the window so the parents couldn't look in. We played like minute to win it games and had pizza. It was like a very small thing for Gary and I, but made huge impact. And you know, got us a lot of leverage and a lot of buy-in and, and it made the kids, you know, feel so special, you know, so just little things and, you know, it doesn't have to be big, but all of that contributes, you know, to a change. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's a, that's a small thing. It probably didn't take a lot to do. Um, but if you're thinking about when at a time when there's you know, shortages of teachers in places and if you're, if it's a play, if it's a deeper connection with their kids there, cause they're going to teach there, that gave that, that's an educator that's not going to leave because they're going to, they're going to be happy about that. Mm-hmm. So that's a yeah. big deal. Yeah. Um, the, um, I'll, and I will also add, I, I live with an elementary teacher. My wife is an elementary teacher and I've got you know, two little girls. Um, spooky season is the best season. So, so oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I'm, I'm with you. I'm with you. Um, oh, it's crazy. Kind of the, the, the natural follow up to that question and not really a time to like, like really get negative, but as, for listeners who are trying to look for, for roadblocks to avoid, you know what I mean? If you're trying to initiate change somewhere and you can share a story of a time it failed, or you just, you know, share advice, either one's fine. Um, then we'll, so we'll start with Lisa on this one. Can you share a story of a time when, uh, change failed? Like you, you, you were, we were trying to do this and yeah, we just didn't nail it. Well, and probably Gary, I wonder if Gary's thinking the same one of me, like, you know, how he was talking about how we would, say, you know, we had good contacts, good connections, good relationships with the departments in our district, you know, the curriculum and assessment, special ed, you know, all of these. Well, we did kind of, I don't want to say burned a bridge because we didn't burn a bridge, but we didn't make any, we didn't win any friends and influence people. We kind of went up against some special ed numbers that we like. I think we, it was all about staffing. I think we thought we needed another teacher or a couple other paras. And we kind of went up against and said, no, we, you're, we think you all are wrong. You don't think you haven't, I mean, we didn't say it like that, but like we knew that we had crossed the, crossed the line, not intentionally, but we knew that we had upset some people and that we had a lot of work to do to regain that good relationship and it wasn't bad it's just like I, and it might have been worse for Gary and I maybe Gary and I felt it worse than it really was but we were just like oh we we need to do something to make make up for that because you know when you do push 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 because you are trying to do what's right for your school and your kids and your staff sometimes you do are like a dog with a bone and you got to be careful you got to watch how you say things not be too pushy, maybe let some, some things come to light on their own. But we kind of felt like we maybe had pushed a little too hard and we didn't want a bad reputation with special ed. And we kind of felt like we had some, some making up to do. So I, we talked to uh, somebody else from, um, and she was from San Diego. Her name's Andrea Michelle. And she talked about, this is from the teacher perspective of having, uh, like if, if something get kind of put on your plate that you didn't agree with and, and how, what, what could you do about it? And she talked about having a little bit of empathy for the folks because you have, have empathy for kids. We talk about that a lot. Yeah. But have empathy for the folks that lead you as well. Cause sometimes they didn't like bring it to the, they, it wasn't theirs. You know what I mean? And mm-hmm. sometimes they're just kind of in line doing what they're supposed to do, um, which that, that may, maybe that situation, maybe not, but whenever that's something to remember is, you know, have a little bit of empathy both ways vertically. You know what I mean? Um, Gary, you got a, another one you'd share? Yeah. I, the, I should have shared that one. And Lisa should have shared the one I'm going to share. That would have been better. <laughs> Cause I'm going to share Lisa. So I think that the big thing that Lisa and I both went through that we understand is that, you know, there is timing in your life. Um, and sometimes timing's not. And I was thinking of the special ed issue that we had. Um, uh, and I was thinking Lisa would say this, so I'm going to switch that around. But when Lisa had applied for the job, when I applied for it and I got it and she did not, 
and it was um, uh, it was you know it was it was stressful. It was stressful between the two of us because we were calling back and forth, and I'm going, you know, I really want to apply for this. If you don't think they're going to hire you, I don't want someone else in there. I want you to get the job, but yet if if you're not going to get the job, then I want it, and then. I had to go in and go for it, and they ended up hiring me over Elisa, who was the assistant. And it was um, uh, it was a struggle. It was a struggle for uh, for the teachers that were in there that were wanting Lisa. It was a struggle for parents, um, uh, but it was what needed to happen. And Lisa would attest to that too. Is that amen? It was a fantastic situation. Um, you know, we were able to be a great team. We were able to do things in the school that a lot of teams would not be able to do. Um, she already had the support of teachers and knew them there. Uh, me coming in, I, you know, I was there at JRU and so I knew half the staff, but the staff had grown doubled and I was not used to Spanish immersion. And so me stepping into Spanish immersion, I needed Lisa there to be able to help me in that and learn that situation. Um, uh, it was, it really was the perfect fit, but it could have been very, very negative because the bottom line is I came in and interviewed and got the job when she was wanting it. And I can say that knowing that she's shaking her head and she's told the story before, um, you know, we both realized that was the, the that was the perfect scenario for me to be able to be in there, her to be in the position that she was in and prepare her for where she's at now. Um, and so, you know, my big thing is, you know, I, I get all the time people message me on social media. Oh, I wanted this job and I didn't get it. Oh, I wanted to be a principal and I've tried for four years. I want this. I want this. I want this. And I'm just thinking it's just not the right time. It's going to come around. The perfect job is going to be there for you. And when you try to push jobs and push yourself in situations, you often get into a situation that you shouldn't have been in the first place. Yeah. Um, and so I love being able to tell those people that, um, uh, tell people, you know, just wait on it. it. It's not the right school for you. It's not the right time for you. Um, and it will happen if it's supposed to happen. Um, and Lisa and I are the perfect example of that, of being able to go through there and it working out well. Um, and, and just being able to say, wait on it and it's going to come your way when it does. And, you know, there, there may be a reason you don't get the teaching job. You may not want, you know, so you, there may be a reason you're not moved to third grade or you're not the assistant. Um, and a lot of people go through that and you just have to be able to hang in for it and I'm going to grow from it and I'm going to be better because of it. Yeah. And I'm going to go back to one of the things that I think helped me was that I was older. And so I think, you know, I was older. I wasn't, you know, it wasn't my first job. It wasn't, but it also helped that. And so I was older. That's number one. Number two, Gary and I knew each other. We were already good friends. Um, so that helped. Then I think the two of us, well, and he was very gracious and very, you know, he was, he was very gracious about the whole thing. And I remember, I mean, I had to just set my mind to it. And I said, that when they came to introduce him as the principal, the director said, Lisa, you don't have to stay if you don't want to. I said, oh, no, I'm staying because everyone on the staff is going to be watching me and I want them to see that I support him. So, yeah, am I hurt and all that? Yes, but I'm not going to not support him. So, you know, it was it was weird and hard. I mean, what it maybe it was weird for a minute, but after and I think it's because I'm older. We knew each other. We trusted each other and. I knew within two weeks why I didn't get that job because I had other things in my life I was getting ready to go through that I didn't know. And I couldn't have done this job had I, had I gotten it then. And then what I learned so much from Gary, like that was the the most fun seven years of my entire life. Like we had fun. Did we work hard? Heck yeah, we did, but we had fun. So we have stories. Oh gosh, Gary, don't we? We have so many stories about each other and, you know, so, and somebody told me it's hard to be a prophet in your own land. Mm-hmm. So I ended up being a prophet in my own land finally, but you know, time it's timing. Gary's right. It's timing too. So I appreciate you both being so candid about that because that's a situation that I think a lot of folks go through and they don't, they don't feel comfortable talking about it a lot of times. You know, there's hurt feelings somewhere. Um, and, but you guys were able to navigate it and, you didn't you didn't lose really quality people because of it. You you got a stronger team as a result of it, which it should be that should be the result of those that process. It should end up that way. Um, the uh, the last question here is is an advice question. So we're talking to educators who are trying to find ways to improve culture in a way that can scale and be sustained. And you can pick 
whatever role you want to pick from this. So you can you can talk to teachers, you can talk to principals, you can talk to VPs, uh, folks at district offices. But we're looking at ways, and this is um, kind of it works really well for you guys. But the scale and sustain part. The you know how do I make this change and it, it stays there after I go. You know, and like that because you know the school's still going to be there, the kids are still going to be there. How do how do I make it better and it still grow? You know, um, and we'll we'll start with Gary on this one. Okay, I, I didn't quite understand the question. Are you asking me say 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 it again? I got so. Um, hey, what advice would you give them if they want to want to scale and sustain change? Like from 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 their role, and you could pick principal or teacher. Think about you know how, what what can they do to make it last. Hey, he's not very smart. Let me go first. You Let go me first. Do, go for it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to talk to teachers. Okay, I'm going to give advice to a teacher. How does a teacher ignite change outside their classroom? Well, I would, if I could, talk to teachers and say, be a part of the change. Be supportive. Like, and Gary knows how I love Adolf Brown. Adolf Brown says, "Do you know the pilot when you get on your airplane? When you get on an airplane, no." Do you know their political affiliation? No. Their religious beliefs? No. Their sexual orientation? No. But do you cheer for them? Yeah, you do. So to teachers, cheer for your pilot, cheer for your captain, whether that's your team leader, whether that's your principal, whether that's your district um, d- a director or your superintendent, cheer for your pilot or your captain. And if you don't like what they're doing, go have a conversation, be able to support them so that you can feel comfortable about supporting them, but be supportive, be consistent, be supportive. Don't be a naysayer, get involved. If you don't like something they're doing, or you want to do something different, get, be a part of something different. Ask if you can do, if they're doing A, ask if you can do B and just be a part of change because changes can be good. But you've got to be supportive. You can't be a naysayer and you can't be negative, Nelly, because that kills everything. Yeah, you got to come to the table with solutions. And I would uh, jump on the same thing as of the change agent as a principal. Do not be afraid to be a change agent. And, you you know, I know that there are some very negative situations and there are some some central offices and some school boards that say you will absolutely do this. But if if somebody's asking you to do something that's not. Um, in the best interest of your teacher, it's not in the best interest of their time, of their mental health, of what's going on for school. Do not feel bad about standing up for it and saying, you know, we're, we, I don't believe that we should do this, and here's what I want to do, and here's why. Um, be the change agent. And the one, I'm just floored when someone says, oh, my district makes me have three meetings a week. That's ridiculous. As a leader, you should be able to stand up and say, you know, I understand you want me to do this, but this is something that's going on that's negatively affecting your staff that's coming down from central office or from the board initiative, then you need to sit down and have a heart to heart with those people and try to be the change. Agent. And here's the deal. If they say no, then guess what? You do what they say because they're the, they're the leader, just like your teachers. You're going to have teachers. I want a teacher to come to me and say, I don't think we should have to do this. And here's why. But if it comes down to it, they're going to need to do what I tell them to do. And that's the same with the superintendent, same with central office. But don't just blindly go and say, oh, we're going to have three meetings a week. All the teachers are going to turn in lesson plans. We're going to do weekly learning checks. We're going to, do, you know, if that doesn't fit, if that's overwhelming, if you're looking at your staff saying my staff is about to leave me because you're requiring them to turn in lessons, have a team meeting, have a staff meeting, have a grade level meeting, have it on, then you need to go to them and say, this is what I'd like to do. If they say no, that's okay, but be the change agent. Don't feel bad about stepping up. You know you're building more than anybody. And if they are getting overwhelmed with things, then you need to be the one to step up and say, we're not going to do this, and this is why, and this is the negative effect it's having on my staff. And then if they say tough, then move on with it. Um, uh, but a lot of times what you're going to feel is, okay, we we didn't know that. We didn't understand that. And, you know, our district is amazing with differentiation. We have the best differentiation training. You need a specialist. You can call anybody at central office, and you can find someone. But sometimes they lose the mark when it comes to differentiating for schools. And you have to be the one that says, we are 36 elementary schools, and we are all different, and I'm not going to do exactly the same that Brenda Cowan does, because Brenda Cowan's students are different than my students. And so don't be afraid to do that, because that's what makes a change agent, and that's what helps you to be able to support your staff. So it's kind of to tie those two together, because I like how I like the parallels of those, about you know cheering for the pilot, and then the way I would, I would connect those is, there's a reason there's a pilot, and, it's, and we're not autopilot you know what i mean the individual schools there's a reason that per, that principal is there 
because he's got to know the school and like he's got to know his airplane, that kind of thing. So I liked how that tied together. Um, we're we're kind of at the end here. At um, and before we go, though, I want to make sure that the listeners can find you guys on, on social media. And if you want to want to plug anything, now it's time to plug. We'll, we'll start with Lisa. Where can they find you? <laughs> well, yeah, just look at Gary. Shut up, Gary. Well, my uh, Instagram is. <laughs> yeah, no, I am like very, like people will say, did you see Gary's video? I go, no, I didn't watch it. Like I am not on Facebook very much. I mean, I do have a Facebook account, but it's just my personal one. But Liberty Elementary does have a Facebook page. So it's Liberty Elementary. I think that's all it is. Liberty Elementary. And then there's a Liberty Elementary PTA page. And, um, but no, I'm not big on social media yet, but I do want to start a podcast. I told um, Jordan when we were meeting, so I want to start a, a Liberty podcast. So I'll let you know if I get that going, Jordan, you might need to help me. But no, I barely have time to watch Gary Brooks, Instagram and TikTok and video. Uh, so there you go. So uh, yeah, on another episode, it, it'll publish, I think, um, well, the timeline will be, with, be different for the folks listening, but it it'll, should be out before this one. Is a guy by the name of Dr. Anthony Tricala. Uh, he's at a charter school in Florida, and he runs a podcast for his staff. And I, I talked about about me and you talking about that to him. And so I, I get you guys together at some point. So yeah, um, yeah. Get, Gary, where can where can they find you if they have not already found you? Where can they find you? Yeah, everything. All of mine is on Gary Brooks Prin P R I N like principal. So it's G E R Y B R O K S P R I N. That's TikTok. That's Twitter. That's uh, Instagram. That's Facebook. Um, that's all of my social media. It, all the hashtag is Gary Brooks Prin, uh, all one word. Um, and I'm on all of them. So, yeah. Well. And if anyone has not seen it, my favorite, second favorite video of his is what principals do on snow days. <laughs> it's one of his early, early ones. He did it here at Liberty. And that I mean, it's but it's one of my favorite ones. And um, the other thing I want to leave you with is it. This is something that Gary taught me, and I t- say it all the time. If you can say yes, say yes. So just think about that when you're, you know, parents want something, teachers want something. If you can say yes, say yes. If it's no skin off your nose, if it's not, say yes. Absolutely. The principles on snow days thing is funny because if you've done, if, 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 even if you've been in schools, if you've been a teacher, I don't think you have any idea that folks go in on snow days. Like, <laughs> we do. There's a, there's a couple folks yep. there. Yep. Uh, so the custodians, that's it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I thank you guys both for your time. I know you are both incredibly busy right now. Um, so, Lisa, have a great start to school. Gary, I hope you get everybody kicked off right. Um, so thank you guys very much. <laughs> the flywheel effect, harnessing the power of momentum to create a school culture that celebrates change and drives its